This episode of Reptiles with At and Cat is dedicated to Wild Care Cape Cod. I was lucky enough to land an internship there this summer, and I want to share some of my experience with you. So stay tuned to meet some of the patients from July and early August of 2019. These tiny birds are the smallest baby birds that I've ever seen. They are the size of the first knuckle on my pinky. This is a black-capped chickadee who's almost ready to go out into one of our aviaries. She loves to eat mealworms and has a favorite stick in her cage that she likes to sit on when she eats them. But she has to be careful when she eats them because they just might wiggle away from her. When she is successful in getting them to her preferred stick, she then has a method for eating them. Since the mealworm is alive, her first task is killing it, otherwise it might get away. Once she kills it, she eats the insides before then swallowing the body whole. This is a white-winged scoter, a gorgeous bird that came in with pellets in his wing. The poor sea duck was shot by someone and unfortunately was too far gone for us to save. This is a cedar waxwing. They are little bandit birds who adore fruit. They have a high-pitched call and seem to always be hungry. We had two barn swallows and one tree swallow, so they all stayed together in a tall cage to give them lots of room to fly. Blue jays belong to the corvid family, with crows, ravens, and a few other birds. They are highly intelligent birds that can learn to mimic sounds. They also imprint very easily, so we have a screen in place to prevent the blue jay from imprinting on humans. This young red-tailed hawk came in with a broken leg and a broken wing. He is a beautiful bird and fearful of humans, as he should be. I have noticed that young red-tailed hawks seem to have a concerned look on their face that they eventually grow out of, but it is awfully cute. We bandaged up the hawk and let him heal. I have learned so much about raptors this past summer. I was always afraid of the beaks, but now I know that the talons are much more dangerous. However, the beak is still something to be cautious about. Once the hawk was strong enough, we moved him to the elliptical, where he could strengthen his wings. He has a variety of perches set up in his enclosure in the elliptical to challenge him to fly up, down, and all around. Whenever it is time for me to feed him, I like to hide defrosted mice on different perches and spaces all over the elliptical. Later in the day, I will go and check to see if he found all the mice. When I hide them, I usually wave them around so that he can see the mouse and where I put it. So it's not really hiding, more like challenging him to use his perches and move around the enclosure. He is definitely getting stronger and will soon be ready for freedom. This least turn chick was hit by a cyclist on the beach. He is just a couple of days old and you can still see the egg tooth on the end of the beak. We fed him Pedialyte every 30 minutes to hydrate him before we tried to feed him mealworm pieces. In the wild, least turn chicks are up on their feet pretty quickly and leave the nest a couple of days after hatching. They eat small fish, crustaceans, and insects. Once he gained a little weight and was a bit stronger, we gave him a couple of small fish to eat. It was amazing watching him swallow the whole fish. Our turkeys have gotten so big that they need double their normal bowls to keep them all happy. We try and give them enrichment every day to keep them thinking and to prepare them for life in the wild, where nothing is the same. I like to put grass and stuff in their bowl to show them what some of the stuff they will encounter in the wild looks like. We also cut some raspberry branches with some ripe raspberries and put them in there to show them what raspberries are. They get grain with live mealworms buried in it, as well as a fruit and vegetable bowl. They still do not really like orange vegetables and are unsure about the fruit, but they like to dig for the veggies that they do like. We did release the big group into a family this month, but we also got two new baby turkeys in. They are much too young to be put with the older turkeys.
These are American goldfinch nestlings. Their branch was cut, but we put their nest into a little basket and put it back up on the tree and watched the mother return to all five of her babies. We have had several nestling mourning doves come in. They are a bit harder to take care of because we feed them using a cut syringe that holds their food and the thumb piece of a glove to serve as a bib for the baby bird. As a result, the young mourning doves like to beg from people once they are in the aviary. This means that some of them come right up to you, cooing and ruffling their feathers. They also like to land on people's heads, but they do eventually learn to eat on their own and start ignoring us in favor of the company of other birds which is exactly what we want. These young screech owls were found in an air vent of a house that was being renovated. Signs of food were found with them, so we know that their parents were able to get to them, but they could not stay inside the house. The construction workers got permission from their historical society to put up an owl house on the property. So after the young owlets were checked out and given the all clear, Regina put them in the owl house on the property. The next day, Regina and I went to check on them to make sure that they were all okay and we found three sleepy chicks inside the box, as well as one scared mama. A happy ending for the Screech Owl family and an exciting experience for Regina and I. This is a common loon. Notice how far back the feet are? Loons do not walk well at all. They are hardly ever on land. The only time loons come ashore is when they are nesting or when something is wrong. Common loons are seabirds and spend most of their time in the water. Their feet, or should I say flippers, are designed to propel them through the water after fish. They are fantastic swimmers and great divers. I put a few live fish into the seabird pool with this loon to see if she could dive, and she showed me that she could. She went right underwater once she spotted a fish and chased it around underwater. It was really cool to see. They have very sharp beaks and use them as weapons, piercing opponents or predators. We wear protective goggles around them should they go after our eyes. She swam around with her head submerged, looking at for fish after that. It gave me a great opportunity to watch her feet and see how they swim. I did not even know Loon's worst bird before this internship. So the amount that I've learned in just a couple of months is amazing. <laughs> baby shower at the end of June, our mallard duck eggs hatched, and we found ourselves with ducklings. Eileen, our resident female mallard foster duck, became a foster mother to them. In July, we brought them to a pen in the elliptical, where they would have more space as well as some separation from humans, because we did not want the ducklings to imprint on anyone other than Eileen. We eventually had to bring Eileen inside, but we put the older duckling that had been with the turkeys with these babies, and they are all doing really well. They have water troughs, a kiddie pool to swim in, duck ring with live mealworms, and various vegetables and fruit to choose from. I love watching them swim and eat because I have never really seen ducks where I live. I do not think that I've ever seen ducklings in person before. Something that I learned that I think is really important for everybody to know is that bread is really bad for ducks, as well as other birds. If you ever want to be like the bird lady in Mary Poppins and feed the birds, Offer them lettuce or peas. These ducklings love peas. I put peas in their water dishes and in their pool, and they loved going after them. It was so cute to watch. Ducklings grow up so fast. It is crazy how quickly they grow up. They are already starting to look like adults, and they've only been hatched for a little over a month. This juvenile northern gannet is one of many that have come into the clinic. Unfortunately, all of the juvenile northern gannets that have come in have not survived long enough to be released. The adult northern gannets have this amazing white plumage with pale yellow heads. This gannet is our longest lasting one. He lives in the seabird room now and gets to go swimming in a pool every day. Good things. He's got so much space there. It's got to be. Because of the thermals that they glide, they, they've got to have super strong muscles so that keep So this one is the vein, right? And then there's an artery that runs next to it. So is this the vein? That looks like the vein. Oh, 
Well, that's red underneath it, so that would be the artery, right? No? I think so. <laughs> How come your veins aren't like gigantic bird? I think that's the vein. I'm gonna have to put a needle in it and see what happens. Oh. See that crossover vein there? What's that called? The brachial? Yeah. yeah. That right there, that little strip of red, that's the vein of choice to get on birds sometimes, but it's usually bigger than that. But it's flat and it's hard to get because it's so flat, and that one is so tiny. It's very tiny. I still think this is a baby. Why? Because of his behavior. But he's sick. I know I'm not right. Okay. He's a baby then. Trash Your Tackle is a wild care initiative to educate people about the importance of not cutting your line. This common turn was brought in with the fishing line stuck in his wing. Stretch the wing out so we can see it in him. Oh, um. Um. Don't, don't take it out. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to document our tackle things. Okay. This poor bird had to suffer because of one person's decision. The choices you make affect many, many lives, so always choose wisely. Jennifer was able to remove the line without causing further harm to the turn. Luckily, the damage caused by the line was mostly superficial, and the common turn was able to be released a couple of days later. A happy ending that very easily could have been a different story. So many animals are killed every year as the result of poor p fishing practices. So please help Wildcare reduce those numbers. We have had several common turns as patients this summer, and some are not as fortunate as that one. To test if a seabird or a shorebird is waterproof, we fill a large tub with water and put them in it. They get to paddle around and clean their feathers, and we get to enjoy watching them. Salt water is more buoyant than fresh water, but the buoyancy is not a problem for this common turn. She cleaned her feathers and had a really good time paddling around in her little pool. I love watching their little feet because that is something you never see when they are in the water. Common terns eat small fish, so we gave her a couple of live fish and watched her catch and eat them. The first one was too slippery for her, but she managed to catch and swallow the second one whole. Chimney swifts are another bird that I did not know existed until my internship at Wild Care. Now, however, I will never forget them.
so many of them. This is a juvenile herring gull. I did not know that there were different types of seagulls, but this summer I've encountered herring gulls, great black-backed gulls, laughing gulls, and ring-billed gulls. I also learned that herring gulls take about four years to reach sexual maturity, which means four years before the gull looks like an adult. When we have a clean crate for seagull to move to, we like to let them move on their own. So we open their crate door and let them wander out and around, stretching their wings before guiding them into their clean crate. We also have an outside pen that we like to put them in on nice days. They really enjoy being outside. This juvenile herring gull is younger than the other one. We can tell because this one has more brown feathers than white or gray. She really loves to stretch her wings. One of our volunteers got to release her on Harding Speech in Chatham when she became strong enough. These osprey chicks are kind of famous. Osprey build nests on top of trees, or more commonly, it seems, on telephone poles. People have started building posts for osprey to build their nests on, in the hopes that they won't keep building their nests in dangerous areas. These guys' nests collapsed because the wood rotted and sent them careening to the ground. Luckily, they were not injured, but they were guests of wild care for a few weeks, while some amazing people built them a new place for the nests to rest in. I got to help re-nest them, which was an amazing opportunity that I never thought I would have. Leah and I put them into two separate plastic tubs, and I drove them to, to Sisuit Harbor, where their nest was. Jane invited me to go up with her in the cherry picker to help put the two chicks back in their nest. It was amazing putting them back up there, but I was so worried that the chicks would be scared of us and jump out of the nest. Luckily, they stayed there and called for their parents. We went back to the ground and waited for the parents to show up. After a few hours, they did show up, and we all left knowing the chicks were safe when their parents care. From the small to the big, wild care has gotten it all this summer. Within two days, we got two non-related juvenile bald eagles admitted to the clinic. The first one came from Harwich and was brought in because it was flying low to the ground and was chewing on beach towels. After performing an exam, we found that this eagle was suffering from starvation, intestinal parasites, and anemia. The federal bands around the bird's leg identified it as being a chick from a Massachusetts nest. The second juvenile bald eagle came in from Truro because it was low-flying and crashed into someone's deck. After an exam, we found that he was also suffering from starvation and anemia, as well as an injured eye. This eagle was a bit smaller than the first one, leading the state ornithologist to believe that it is a Floridian bird. We are both on the mend and getting stronger every day due to lots of fluids and fish. The first couple of days, they stayed in crates in the clinic and were tubed to give them more fluids. After they began to improve, we started them on a diet of small fish. After a few days, they had improved enough that they needed more space, so we brought them out to the two pens in the our elliptical. At this time, they were eating bigger fish and could see each other from across the room. We had stores of frozen fish that was donated that we would thaw out for the eagles. As they got healthier, we gave them larger fish because that is more like what they will be eating in the wild. Some people donated fresh fish that they caught on their boat specifically for the eagles. It was really touching to see how many people came to donate fresh as well as frozen fish for birds that they could only see pictures of. It really made me see how innately good people are. A few days later, we decided to move them to a larger pen together. Now they are residing in one of our larger pens in our elliptical, which is Wild Care's largest aviary. They have room to fly and they love eating the fresh fish that is donated. I am so lucky because I got to handle them this summer. And what a unique experience that is. How many people get to assist in the recovery of two bald eagles? They are absolutely incredible birds. This is our American crow. We have been trying to find another crow for him to be with because he is highly intelligent and needs to learn how to interact with other crows. No one we called had a crow for us to put with him, so we put him in one of our aviaries so he had a safe place to grow up. Unfortunately, if we release him, he has no crow social skills since he's been around people most of his life. We are unsure what we plan to do with him, but there is talk of seeing if he can become an educational animal, and he would be great at it because of how smart he is. I have to give him a new toy every day, otherwise he will get really bored, but he really is just lonely. I gave him the nickname Loki because of how mischievous he is. He loves to fish as well as try and untie my shoelaces. Whenever I bend over to refill his bowls, he likes to land on my back and stand on my head to watch what I'm doing. He also loves to play fetch with a pine cone.
I learned an interesting thing about eastern box turtles. Apparently, they love earthworms. I always thought that tortoises were herbivores, and generally they are. But this summer, I saw just how much they enjoy eating eggs, as well as earthworms. This juvenile common snapping turtle was run over while trying to cross the road. Thankfully, the injuries he sustained were not major and resulted in his right eye being amputated. We wanted to see whether he would be able to hunt with only one eye because if he could, then we would release him once he was all healed. We set him up in an aquatic tank with a float and lots of fun things to explore. We left him alone so he could get off his float whenever he wanted. And when I checked on him later, he was underwater and exploring. I brought him two pieces of fish and used long hemostats to drop a fish piece in front of him to see if he was interested. I used the long hemostats because I was not about to be risk being bit by a snapping turtle. He was very interested, so I gave him the second piece. It was really cool watching him eat because once he bit it, he kind of just sucked it down. They only really use their mouth to grab the food and they kind of just swallow it whole. Once we knew he was interested in food, we put a couple of live fish in the tank with him, and we could, when we could not find them the next day, we knew that he was ready for release. It was to x-ray this way and x-ray sideways to see where that goes down. Okay. And at least we'd have that for someone who knows what to look for there. Have I mentioned how much I enjoy releasing animals? This eastern box turtle was brought in after being hit by a car. Part of her left back foot was ruined, so we removed it and waited for her to heal. She is able to use the healed stump just as well as her other legs, so I brought her to a woodsy area and released her. She seemed to have a hard time realizing that there was no longer a glass barrier blocking her way, but she took off into the woods. I made sure she was heading away from the road and into the brush before I left because I did not want her to get hit again. Contrary to popular belief, turtles are pretty fast. Some tortoises can be very slow, like Galapagos tortoises, but that is because they are massive. Eastern box turtles can move pretty quickly when they want to. No, I don't think it's any like a wound. I think it's a wound. I think it's... It's not like a tumor. Anything. I think it's a tumor. She looked fine, the other appendages. That's very weird, lady. Isn't that bizarre? Yeah. So, like, this this is a fracture we could handle here. Um. Dehydrated because they're not in their mother's, mother's pouch. This is a juvenile white-footed mouse. At this age, we no longer hand-feed them. Instead, they are offered what we call mush. It is made up of baby rice cereal and baby squirrel formula. We also offer them walnut pieces when they are this small, so they have something to nibble on. When they get bigger, they go out to the barn, where they get a bigger enclosure and a wheel. All of the mice seem to like the wheels. It is hysterical seeing one mouse run in the wheel, while the other two, one or two just hold on and spin. This summer, I've taken care of so many baby eastern gray squirrels. We don't have any squirrels by themselves. We always put them in a group of other squirrels about the same size. Each squirrel has its own unique personality. As they grow, they become funnier and funnier. I've learned that they love vegetable peelings more so than actual vegetables, and that some squirrels love squash more than sweet potato. I got to release one at Wild Care, and it was really special because I helped to raise these guys so releasing them is momentous for me. I put a towel in the hole for his box so that he could not jump out at me while I was getting his box set up outside. Once I took the towel up, he poked his little head out and checked out his new locale. He now has a safe house as well as the whole forest to explore. We had three pinky squirrels come in with major injuries from falling out of their nest. To feed them, we wrapped them up like a burrito so they can't wiggle away. 
And one of them had a really swollen eye, mm. which I am concerned about because he doesn't have a slit yet. I don't know if we can clip it or whatever, so. Okay. All right. So we just kind of do the straight jackety burrito thing. Burrito squirrel. Yep. And they are called pinkies because they are pink, as well as the fact that they are the size of your pinky finger. They grow up really fast though. We usually do not name animals because it is hard if they do not make it, but we gave these three nicknames to help us identify them. The squirrel with major head trauma is called Bumpy. The squirrel with a swollen eye is called Popeye, and the squirrel with the abdominal bleeding is called Abby. All three are healing well, though, and are becoming brownies with their fur coming in. They get more and more wiggly as they grow up. By the time that they are turning gray, their ears are mostly up, but their eyes are still closed. Their tails are starting to look feathery instead of like a mouse tail. They are really sweet sisters and love sleeping in a massive squirrel ball. But when they are hungry, they sure do wiggle around. After they eat, they become super tired and fall asleep almost immediately. I still cannot believe how fast they are growing up. They look like squirrels now instead of unidentifiable baby animals. All three of them have had their eyes opened on my last day, so that was an amazing thing to leave on. Thank you, Wild Care, for allowing me to intern with you this summer. I had an amazing time and have learned so much. I'm really going to miss you guys.